What's up, podcast world? Thank you so much for joining us for another fantastic episode of Uncrushed. We are here with Teji Thomas. Teji is a Salesforce administrator for transportation alternatives, and he's been a project manager for Uncrushed itself now for a few months doing his thing. We're really excited to talk about Teji today, and we're going to tackle some pretty heavy issues. We're going to try to keep it as lighthearted as possible, while at the same time addressing these really serious things that people deal with every day. Teji, welcome to the show. Thank you, James. Glad to be here. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about yourself, where you come from, how you uh, got where you are today. Um, I think the world is in need of people with your tenacity and grit. So tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, well, um, to take it quite literally, I drove up from Maryland um, <laughs> uh, to get here today. Um, what's funny is uh, I used to drive around here all the time. And um, nothing's really changed with the traffic. So I'm yeah. kind of like, oh, I remember this. Um, but before that, um, you know, I, I was born in India, uh, Kerala specifically, lived in uh, Mumbai, and then uh, grew up in the Bronx in the 80s, and then uh, lived in northern New Jersey, specifically Dumont, New Jersey. Um, and then from there, I was, uh, you know, went to school, uh, actually St. John's uh, in Queens, and then I transferred to Manhattan College in the Bronx, um, got out of school, was working, and, you know, got married, moved down to D.C. And, um, you know, lo and behold, here I am um, kind of back in back in the mix, as they say. Hey, you know, they say it's hard to get away from where you come from. That's yep. what they say. I'm originally from Miami and I miss home until I get there. Shout out to you, 305. <laughs> right. It's the most stressful place in the world I've ever been in my life. <laughs> but I understand what you mean. Yeah. I mean, I think, um, you know, the journey that I've kind of been on um, at very pivotal moments in my life have have shaped me to to where I am. So I look at things in kind of different lenses. And I think uh, having grown up in another country, um, you know, growing up in the Bronx, living in New Jersey, being in the Washington metro region, and then kind of coming back um, kind of has these circles that you complete uh, but you learn about yourself like, hey, this is what I was thinking about when I used to live here or these are the emotions and feelings that I was kind of feeling when I was here or I wasn't aware of any of this stuff. Sure. Um, so I think I think on that level, um, it's trying to create that awareness. Right. Like um, but at the same time, you know, figuring out. Have I overstayed or is this just my comfort zone to the point where I'm not growing, learning, kind of pushing myself. And I think at times, um, you know, you could feel like that in life. Um, and I think one of those things that I've come to realize is some of the most scariest things are the things that, you know, you know when you look back, you're like, what was I afraid of? You know, yeah. and to kind of put that forward. I, I look back sometimes at things that a lot of people I think would be afraid of uh, and how I felt in the moment. And it's definitely afraid, but it's funny how in retrospect, we look back and we see the things that we can appreciate out of that fear, right? Sure. Fear, fear has a totally different shape when it's in your rear view mirror. Yeah, you know? absolutely. Uh, all right. So let's, uh, let's talk about why you came to the show. I know that you've got a story that you want to share uh, and it's a sensitive story for those of you out there that struggle with emotions. I can tell you now that this is one that was a roller coaster ride when I heard it. Uh, and I try really hard to preface those types of stories for folks that are prone to, to tear jerkers, right? I'm a, I'm a sensitive guy, despite what people might think. Uh, so I feel emotion really strong, especially for your story. So let's talk about why you came to the show and the story that you want to share. Sure. Um, well, for me, it's been a journey and it's a ongoing journey. Um, and if I had to look back, I'd have to go all the way back to my childhood. Um, you know, I, I grew up in a time where, um, you know, children are seen, but not heard. Yeah. Um, you know, I also think being an immigrant, uh, shaped a lot of who I am today right. and especially with what's going on in the current news cycles and just being the other um, is really hits home. Um, and I think looking back to the adversity that I experienced as a child, um, you know, and realizing that there was a point where my parents weren't around, 
um, the anxiety that it caused me as a child. Um, I really didn't know how to understand that. And I think um, kind of, oh, this is moving forward. <laughs> this is falling <laughs> off. Um, is, is, so the, the, the gist of all this was really to, to try to understand this and unpackage this. And I think um, growing up in a different country, coming to the United States, growing up at the Bronx in the early 80s, um, literally it was fight or flight. Um, and then kind of being plucked up and moved to you know Bergen County, New Jersey was his own struggle to fit in. Um, and then going off to college again, trying to fit in. But w along that process, uh, you really don't, and I didn't know what was going on. And so uh, feeling accepted along that way was crucial. And I think it's a very human thing, um, but you're not aware of what is going on inside. And I think over that period of very traumatic events that happen to you, um, impact you and it stays with you. And so now I've, you know, listened to a bunch of books, talked to a lot of experts, gone to conferences, um, you know, joined different support groups to process all this. And I realized that it's going to be a lifelong journey. And I think for me, um, you know, when I, even when I first started to kind of get help, as they say, you know, my psychiatrist, um, the first psychiatrist I saw had killed herself and her 13 year old son. Yeah. And this is kind of very early on in, you know, how do I move forward with this? Yeah, you're still processing, processing and then yep. you go through this this psychological process with a, a professional. Correct, correct. And um, I didn't know what to do. Um, this is not one of those conversations you have with just anybody. Yeah, well, you're going to go find another psychologist <laughs> right. to have the conversation about your psychologist. Right, right? and <laughs> yeah, and, and, and I think, and that, um, I didn't know how to navigate it for a long time, sure. but I knew I had to kind of keep going forward in whatever best way that I thought was best. And yeah. so at that time, you know, I was also uh, realizing like um, the, some of the things that I was keeping busy with. So a couple of years before that, I was working on a startup that did um, really miserable um you know, try to sprinkle get, a little failure in there. Yes. Yeah. Uh, you know, several competitions to get funding, um, trying to, but then I also had my two small children that were, I was a stay at home parent mm. for a while. Yeah. Um, it's big pressure and just trying to do everything. Um, trying to be, you know, like I'm going to, I'm going to kick ass. I'm going to like, I'm going to blow it out of the water. I'm super gonna, dad. Yeah. yeah. Uh, super dad, super entrepreneur, you name it. Super um, everything. Yeah. yeah. Let's just get it all. Yeah. Yep. Um, life's too short, seize the day. Um, you know, and a lot of that comes from kind of how I grew up, um, you know, facing adversity, uh, you know, like not backing down um, and kind of pushing through. But, you know, my body, um, you know, took took the hits. And, and for me, the hardest part was knowing that I've taken a hit. Um, you know, physically and mentally, but then I just kept kind of pushing forward through it. And then, um, you know, worked on this large conference uh, called TEDx Brooklyn. It was the first one in Brooklyn. Took a year of my life to basically put it all together, even though I wasn't living in Brooklyn. Um, but at the same time, juggling two small children um, and making it happen. And then one, once the conference was all over, I basically had to... Um, you know, take some time to kind of decompress. But I remember that night I was coming home from New York City on the way to New Jersey and I fell asleep at the wheel, um, you know, and crashed into a park. And then next thing you know, I realized like, what the hell just happened? And yeah. it was like within seconds. And I realized like, should I be alive right now? Like, what is this? And, you know, the police came and all this kind of stuff. And they were like, are you okay? And I realized at that moment, like I had literally driven my self to exhaustion. And this is my body of saying like, we're, we're stopping everything. And um, obviously then, you know, I was, I was okay. Like nothing really happened. And, um, you know, it was a wake up call in a way that I had to step back and realize 
what could have happened. Um, even for all the things that I led up to getting there, what the end outcome would have been. And then through that process, um, you know, going to doctors and kind of like figuring out all the medical really started my journey. And that's when, you know, um, kind of this incident happened with the, the psychiatrist, uh, which really shook me in so many ways. But, you know, I had to keep going forward. So here you are, right? You're this budding young entrepreneur. You've got all these wonderful things going for you, two beautiful kids. Uh, and then suddenly at the blink of an eye, you fall asleep behind the wheel and it hits you like a ton of bricks, right? You're, you're burnt out. You've done too much. You've extended yourself far too far. What, uh, what was the next step for you? Once you've, once you hit that wall and everything changed for you, your, your perception essentially gets changed. I don't know for those of you out there that have had a near death experience, you probably, understand what it is to come out of something like that and view your life a little bit differently, if not a lot differently. Um, was it that way for you? Did you, did you flash up and, and suddenly there was like a whole new perspective? So first it was just the shock. Yeah. Um, because you know, it's like the police come, the tow truck come and then you're like, what just happened? It's a lot of action. Yeah. yeah. Scene of, a, uh, scene of an accident yeah. is a lot happening. Um, and then it's like flashes of like moments of things that I've experienced on some level. So like past traumatic things now like are flashpoints. I see. Um, and I and it was like stuff in like college. There's no explanation there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, high school, grade school, when I was a toddler, like I'm like, I felt. Like, I, I was like, did I, like, and I'm like, did I really get hurt? Like, you know, like what, what just took place? Yeah. And I think that took a really long time. Um, and that began the process of, you know, going to the doctors. Uh, and then, you know, one of the doctors said, you know, you're, we diagnosed you with sleep apnea, you know, which was like, oh, wow. Okay. Um, so there's a medical term for this now. Um, but then it was also realizing, um, you know, I was walking around with a torn meniscus for like a year. Hmm. Which didn't even notice didn't, that, right? Didn't, didn't notice that. Um, my way in the past used to be exercise your way out of a slump. Yeah. Um, you know, Power I up, through. Yep. I uh, grew up playing soccer. I wrestled. I did track. Um, a couple of years prior to that, I ran three New York City marathons. And so that was my way to kind of like push through it. And then, you know, I saw one doctor and the doctor said, you know, we'll give you cortisone shots for it. But then another doctor said, you know, if you want to get back to being physically active, we're going to have to have surgery. Yeah. Um, and this all happened kind of pretty much within the same year. So, you know, um, and I realized like what, like I'm going to have, this is my first time getting surgery. Uh, and I was mad at myself, uh, cause I was like, how did, could I let this happen? Yeah. How did I get it to this point? Um, right. and then I was like, great. Now, what do I do about my kids? Because I was at that time taking care of the both of them. And well, you so know, I could tell you're already more self-aware though, at that point than most, I think a lot of people just to kind of set a little bit of a dividing line between how people deal with trauma. A lot of people would see these things happening in their lives and not say, how did I let this get too far? But instead, start blaming other factors in their lives for situations that they're now in. So I think the fact that you asked yourself and had this, the wherewithal, the self-awareness yeah. to say, how did I allow this to yeah. happen is huge. Just yeah. to give you the credit where it's due there. Sure. And at that moment, um, you know, and again, uh, and I specifically remember when I first hurt my knee, that was two years prior to that. Sure. You know, went for a six mile run, did like a sprint workout, played basketball with a bunch of 18 year olds. And, you know, I was hitting all my shots and it was a bunch of like eight, you know, like 18 year olds. And I was like, that's right. I still got it. And <laughs> I should have just walked off the court. Sure. But I kept going. Oh, and yeah. I kept going. And I went up for a rebound, came down and my, my knee just made this noise that, I thought was just like, okay, it's not a big deal. And for me, it was 
that should have been the warning sign. Yeah. But no, I end up, you know, going on and doing another conference and, you know, it was just more and more and more. So, so in that process, and I specifically remember when I started my rehab process was during March Madness. And I always loved March Madness, I loved basketball. And I was like, and that's when I started my rehab. But in that way, um, I, you know, didn't take the crutches. I didn't take the pain meds. And I literally could not get out of bed. And I was on my hands and knees to basically crawl out of bed. Mm. And to the point where I was like, I'm going to have to learn how to walk again. Yeah. Um, however painful this was, um, I realized I have to experience this. And I don't want to kind of sugarcoat it. Um, but the motivation was like, if I ever get back to walking the way that I was walking, um, I'm going to remember this pain in a lot of ways. Uh, I think certain pains you never forget. Yeah. yeah. And, sure. um, emotional or physical. Yep. Yeah. And so in that process, I, uh, you know, like a couple of months, uh, after that, my phone had crashed and lost a lot of contacts to people. And I kind of just like, was like, you know what? I don't really need a phone at this point. Um, felt like you just kind of gave up yeah, on it, huh? Yep. Yeah. Um, and I just wanted to focus on what's kind of like, okay, I need to walk. I don't really need a phone. Um, <laughs> that is important. Walking, uh, walking is good. Yeah. Uh, and I had my kids. So, you know, uh, they would come to therapy with me on just to rehab and kind of see me going through that process. And then it was only um, a little, you know, I would say a month and a half. A good friend of mine reached out and said, what's going on? And I was like, look, man, I, this is what's happening in my life. And you know what? I can't continue the way that I'm going right now. Mm. And so uh, another friend of mine was having his 40th birthday at the time. And I was like, look, I can't go on that trip. I'm sure all you guys are going to have a great time. Yeah. You sort of seclude yourself yep. away. Yep. Yeah. Uh, and I also remember that year um, the Dalai Lama was coming to Washington, D.C. So I decided, you know what? You know, I was I, I was raised Catholic and I was like, you know what? I'm going to go check out the Dalai Lama at the Verizon Center. It was called go. the Verizon Center at the time. Yeah, yeah. And uh, it was my first time just kind of being in that environment where I was like the outsider and just observing and just watching. And then from there, it kind of had a visceral impact uh, on me. And I was like, hmm. And then I started this like journey of like, what is mindfulness and what is... And so I started to kind of like explore um, books, talks, uh, kind of like notable people who talk about mindfulness. And, you know, I was like, OK, I got to I got to reshuffle the deck. Um, I have to look at the way that I interact with everyone. I kind of did an audit of everybody. Uh, including myself, uh, the way that I eat, the way that I drink. Um, you know, I stopped kind of like social gatherings. Yeah. Um, you don't you feel know. like you belong there, right? Yeah. Um, you know, I used to, I used to drink, um, uh, as a way to kind of calm my nerves in social settings. And I realized like, wait, why do I do that? So like literally to the very, uh, micro level, like why do I do that? Your what? personality begins to change. Yep. Sure. And, and so within that process, um, was really exploring that. And I was like, wait, I don't really recognize myself anymore. Uh, who have I, what's the narrative that I've been telling myself and what's the, the thing that I've been saying that this is who I am and, or yeah. at, le at least a projection that I have towards the outside world. And I, and I didn't, I didn't feel comfortable within that. And that kind of sparked this path that I really didn't know what to deal with. And within that time period, it was also when I was dealing with my mental health struggles. Yeah. Um, what were you doing for a living when this was happening? So at that time, I was also, um, so after that conference was done, I was pretty much working with another group um, kind of uh, as a project well, account manager and as a way to kind of like um, somewhat stay involved. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, it was it was a, diffi a difficult road to follow. Um, but I knew I needed to kind of step back from from that role. And so I um, 
you know, wanted to focus on my health. And so I, I took on this role of kind of like a um, um, project organizer, manager for events, which was more about bringing people together. And so it kind of gave me the uh, ability to still stay involved, but not kind of the day-to-day grind of, sure. you know, deadlines and deliverables in a way that added all the pressure right. that I would normally have. And so for me, um, uh, my health became the priority. Uh, and I need, I knew I needed this time to like heal, uh, in whatever way possible. So, uh, in that process was realizing that this is going to be a long road. Um, and then I started going to conferences, uh, speaking to experts, um, and going through like a very, I would say, dozen or so different therapists um, uh, to find the one that kind of understands and go and figures out what I'm going through. Yeah, which was a very um, disheartening experience. But this oh, is I'm where sure. this is where I think uh, um, that was the challenging part because um, you don't know what you don't know. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you you know, people that have to go seek professional help tend to struggle to find the one, right? The, there's always that element of, do I connect with this person? I spent a lot of my younger years in family therapy uh, for lots of different reasons. My family is uh, complicated, as most would probably submit in today's sure. world, right? Sure. There's not a lot of families out there that are, um, you know, the Cleaver family. But or the Brady Bunch, right? Yep. Uh, but in any case, when you're seeking somebody to talk to and unload and get some feedback from and maybe even some advice, you have to connect with that person for them to say things that are going to actually invoke change. So what was what was it for you uh, when you did find that person? Um, you know, tell me about what happened next. You found that person. Yep. And I assume that everything kind of fell together at that point and you were able to kind of pick yourself back up and put some pieces back together. Most people that seek professional help tend to get it, right? Right. As long as they're diligent about going through the prep, the process of grieving or depression or whatever they might be seeking help with, yep. they tend to come out of it okay. Yeah. So what happened next? I think for me, um, the one therapist that I was working with, I could relate to her because of her story specifically with her husband yeah that i'm like oh i'm like your husband in some way and she was also experiencing those same similar challenges with her children yeah so i stuck with her just because i'm like okay if nothing else you deal with this at home <laughs> right yeah. like it's not just you seeing right. me and the you're familiar with right this. Yeah. um and that was the best guess on some level okay. for, and so i stuck with her for a year until it wasn't working anymore. Yeah. And so during this whole process, I was, you know, I set Google alerts to everything that I could think of from like depression, anxiety, ADD, dyslexia, you name it, so that I can kind of stay up. Consume ahead. everything you can. Correct. Knowledge Correct. is power. Yeah. yeah. Um, started and during the conferences that I could, I find books. I, you know, um, started listening to the books. I always had like a difficulty reading books. Um, didn't know that that was like a thing. Yeah. Um, I've um, found an organization called Decoding Dyslexia, which is a national organization that is trying to promote awareness and advocacy for for children. But then also at the same time, I'm like, well, what about the adults in the room? You know, that might be struggling. Um, and I think in that journey, I I saw myself now gravit gravitating towards. Um, experts who've kind of confronted this at all different levels. And so for me, um, but the the harder issue was, right, like what's going on in my home, my family, my friends, like I'm going through this journey, but everyone who kind of knows me knows me at where I was like, you know, before the, you know, the car uh, crash incident, right? Yeah. Or at different points when they, and again, you, most of my, social network was New York, New Jersey. Um, at that time I was living, you know, in Maryland. And so, um, who do you share this with and how do you share this? with? Yeah. You need a support system. Yep. And so that was, uh, very isolating for me in a lot of ways, like, because now I have to share something and then do I share it? Right. And so, 
Um, and little by little, there's like one or two friends that I opened up to. I remember one of my friends had a larger gathering, uh, was everyone within the, the, the room. And I said, look, I'm not going to be drinking alcohol tonight. But I told my one friend, I'm like, I don't, I don't want you to tell this to the other friends because I don't want that attention on me being yeah. like, why aren't you drinking? Yeah. Is everything okay? Correct. Tell us what's wrong. Yeah, right? exactly. Yeah. And I feel um, like we get that from colleagues yeah, sometimes yeah. too. They want to, they want to poke you. Yeah. And, and at that time I wasn't, I didn't know really what was going on. So in that process, um, trying to share this with my parents was also very difficult. I'm sure. Uh, it was also very difficult to share this with my sister, um, you know, even with my wife. Um, and in that moment, um, when you don't have clarity, it's hard to even express those emotions. And so, uh, you know, at, at one point, like, you know, my dad was like, well, this is just life. Like, you got to suck it up. Yeah. You know, um, you got to push through this. You know, we faced adversity. Dad stuff. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but then at the same time, like, you know, it's part of like the immigrant story. Like, look, we went through hardships our whole entire life. Yep. You know, we came to the United States. This country like, was founded on immigrants. Right. right. <laughs> um, and you know what? Like, you're more fortunate than, you know, other people before you. So I had that guilt inside that was like, yeah, well, why am I complaining? I should be grateful about you know, the opportunities and the things that I have in front of me. So, so I pushed through, um, you know, and I had to kind of figure out and navigate this. Um, and, it, and it felt alone uh, in the process um, because I was kind of going through therapists that weren't helpful. I was coming up to New York City to, to you know, different support groups. Yeah. I was going to some support, support groups that weren't helpful. And so it was a lot of like trial and error. Sure. Um, Some people that I know have reported that support groups that they've been to have been full of people that just were unhealthy for them. So correct. they had to find other support yep. groups. It's important you find a support group that works for you that yep. is not unhealthy yep. because some of them can be relatively unhealthy. Absolutely. Not to discourage anyone out there from getting into a support group, but you got to be careful yep. with how and why you get involved with support groups. I think you'd agree. Yeah, absolutely. And I think this is where, um, you know, uh, looking back when you're so desperate um you want help but you know like some people would say oh try this try that and you swear up and down you know i was ready to like you know get a brain scan and that was my holy grail Start thinking something is wrong with yeah. You. yeah um you know i was you know um I was trying very desperately to get into a research study. Uh, you know, I tried at the um, NYU, University of Pennsylvania. I finally got into a research study at the NIH. Um, you know, and it was like, how much is it going to take um, to kind of solve these, you know, questions that I had and who would sure. I need to talk to? And then yeah. I started to realize like, okay, maybe I'll never get the answers. Can I be okay with this? Can I move forward in a way that um, I've done as much as I could possibly do? Yeah. And so for that period, um, you know, I wasn't coming up to New York or New Jersey at that time. And I kind of distanced myself in the way that it's like, you know what? I'm exhausted. I am just, you know, from 2011 to 2013, just like I need time now. And then yeah. that's when, um, you know, June of 2014, June 18th is when I got the call that, you know, I needed to head up to New York. Um, that night I was in the pool trying to learn how to swim better because that's one of the things that I picked up after surgery was I never knew how to swim. And since my running days were pretty much limited or non-existent, swimming was the most thing that I feared the most. Um, I had a near death uh, drowning when I was young. Um, I don't remember it, but, um, it's one of those things that I've always been afraid of water. And so I told myself, this is the one thing that I'm going to try to do to overcome. And, and that night, um, after I was walking back to my car, you know, seeing missed calls from my wife, I call my wife and my wife's hysterically crying saying, you need to go up to New York right now. And she's, and I tried to understand what she was saying. And she's like, you know, your father's been in a terrible um, accident. And I hate to use the word accident, but now I know it's a crash um, and you need to go. And so I basically drove up 
to Long Island. Um, and, you know, uh, in between that time period is also when I'm trying to talk to my mom, who's hysterically crying. My sister was getting ready to go on a flight to, to Mexico. Um, and, you know, all the emotions of everything that you think could possibly be the worst. Yeah. But at the same time, no, this is not going to happen to me. And that drive was the longest drive of my life to, you know, show up at an ER at like 3.30 in the morning um, in a room where you see your dad on a table, um, non-responsive. My mother, my mother was there. My sister was there. Uh, one of my dad's closest friends, his wife and his son was there. And, um, you know, it, it, that was earth shattering. Sure. Um, and then through that process, um, you know, and I'm just kind of still dealing with it, um, was kind of my new reality in a lot of ways. It's a tough thing. I remember when, when my father passed away, it was, I, I had a lot of opportunity to say goodbye. Uh, my father died from ALS. It took a long time, uh, you know, a year or two, a long time, quote mm -hmm. unquote, right? Sure. Relatively speaking. But in this instance, it happens all in a flash. Um, how'd you get through that after everything you had already been through? This blow definitely pushed you over an edge of some kind. And yet here you sit, a Salesforce administrator, very happily uh, married, uh, you, mm -hmm. you know, beautiful kids. Your life went on. Tell people what that process of moving on looked like for you, because I think it's different for everybody. Yep. I am. For me, um, you know, the dam broke. Um, sure. Because there's a lot of people that didn't really know who I was, but my, my father was super involved in the community, um, su super active in um, yep. church activities, um, cultural activities. He was crisscrossing you know, not just in New York City, uh, New Jersey region, but across the country. <clears throat> and so for me, growing up with that, at his viewing, just saw like how many people showed up. And yeah. it also brought up people that I you used to be in contact with, um, but they didn't really know who I was. And so, um, and in a lot of ways, it was an isolated experience because they knew me at one point but now have not seen kind of the, the process that I've been going through. Um, I think, you know, one thing that was a challenge for me was like a stay at home parent, um, especially as a guy, uh, you know, I didn't have the friends or the other folks to kind of like lead on, to talk to, to meet up with, yeah. um, you know, I was sort of like ostracized or kind of dismissed in the mom's group. For example, I took like a, two-year parenting class even just to kind of understand the ideas of like parenting because I was like I don't want to screw up my kids you know um but not realizing like wait a second it's predominantly mothers who are in this group um and I think when my father was killed the way that he was killed um was um you know by a reckless driver um you know it was a sunny night in the summer and all the circumstances led up to even today, I think like, well, you know, what if he had a GPS system? What if he had a um, navigation in his car? Would this have happened? Um, you know, and so, um, but then there was all the aftermath of the things that I had to deal with, the financial and legal issues. Like my parents trusted a lot of people. Um, you know, my house that I grew up in New Jersey was foreclosed on because of the the, you know, the retirement home that my father yeah. and mother wanted to put their money into. Death has an aftermath. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I'm the executor to my father's estate. So um, I had to, you know, at one point in my life, I thought I wanted to go to law school, but didn't get in. But I'm learning all types of law in the process and kind of like the business side of this uh, tragic event and how kind of what I saw for me was like the disconnect that I had with quote unquote, the people that I thought were going to be in my corner. Um, and, um, I was, I was pretty much alone in that process. Sure. And so, um, and grief, um, from what I understand it now is so different. And I think for me, 
um, not understanding like there's there's the the mental health part that I was struggling with and now grief on top of it. Uh, most recently, I heard about like complicated grief and I was like, wait a second, what's that about? And I think for me, um, you know, my my way of kind of dealing with this, like, you know, I got to get got to get back on the horse. So I, you know, went to a, a software company, started up uh, as an account development representative um, to kind of distract me um, from all the stuff that I was dealing with before, because my my days were spent uh, talking to lawyers and all different, you know, there was the stuff that my mom was dealing with in, in India. I was dealing with stuff here in the States, trying to help my mom. Yeah. And I needed a, I needed something else. And I thought I can kind of just put that on pause and focus on being an account development representative for a software company, but realizing I'm also walking into a toxic environment. Um, and I didn't know at the time, so I kind of stuck with it for two years, hoping things would change, but realizing um, kind of the toxicity in the culture was not also helping my mental health, and it just made things worse. Um, and I couldn't recognize the warning signs, but I was sort of like, oh, I got to hit my quota, got to hit my numbers. Got to crush it. Got to crush it. That's right. And you know what? Like, this will make me stronger, right? Like, I... Um, and I was doing whatever I could, like, you know, I, at one point there was a stretch where I was waking up at four o'clock in the morning, like going to the spin class at 545, like, um, cause I went back to what I knew in high school, right? Like I, I went back to my the like, hustle mode. Yeah. Just, yeah. just, I was like, you know the what? Grind. Yep. Just yeah. to, just to push through it. And it got to the point where, um, my dad's, um, you know, death anniversary, holidays, his birthday, all of these things that were happening were impacting me. And in a way that I couldn't just fake it at work as much as I was trying to mask this with my colleagues, um, my wife, my children. Um, and it took me to a very dark place, to a place where I was just like, I can't, I can't deal with this anymore. Um, and I don't know what to do. Um, and at that time, um, the therapist I was working with, I wasn't seeing on a consistent basis because of, again, trying to juggle my work schedule and her schedule. And it wasn't like I can go see her after work. Yeah. Um, and so it got to the point where I had to resign from my job and, uh, work on, you know, my health and kind of stepping back. And it was really hard because I was like, oh, I'm, I'm giving up. Um, I'm throwing in the towel. And I was really hard on myself. Uh, I mean, to the point back in March, like I couldn't even get out of bed because of just, and again, I hadn't lifted anything or did a super crazy workout or anything like that. But I realized looking back, it was just a stress. Well, the emotional exhaustion comes at a physical price. Yep, yep. And, and for me... Um, again, another wake up call, right? Sure. Um, and it was that similar experience when I had recovering from knee surgery or other traumatic moments where like, wait a second, you now have to reset again. And what is this going to look like, you know, with what you're dealing with? And so that's when I, you know, filed for disability and kind of went through the process of like, I need this time now more than ever, um, not just for myself, but my for my wife and two children and anyone who really cares yeah. um, to be the best version of myself. What does that what does that look like to you now? Do you feel like you're the best version of yourself or do you feel like you're still building the blocks? I'm still building the blocks. I feel like everyone out there should always be building the blocks. Yeah. I, it's funny the way that that we talk about work and life balance, because I think that some people get the wrong impression. You want to do what you need to do to hit your goals, but not so much that you become ineffective. And mm -hmm. I feel confident in myself knowing the last like two hours, just about every night for me are like catch up hours, you know? Mm -hmm. And sometimes I take advantage of those hours and I check stuff and respond to people and do some work stuff. And then other nights I say to myself at, you know, seven o'clock at night, 
I'm going to give those two hours to myself this time, you know, and I, I play a video game or I go for a walk with my wife or, you know, go throw the, the Frisbee around the backyard. That kind of stuff is super important. You got to take back your own time. So let's talk a little bit uh, about work-life balance, because I know that you have a message for people out there that dive into work to get away from trauma specifically. Sure. Um, you and I talked about it uh, in a, in a brief sense over the phone. And I, when I, when I wrote to you, what I, what I, you know, what I had imagined our conversation to go like, which is nothing like where it went. Um, <laughs> I, I want to, I want to ask you what managers can do. Like what, what, what if they manage a team and they have all this pressure and stress and personal stuff that's happening in their life. And your response to me was, Oh, that's simple. I don't manage a team. Yeah. So tell me why you feel like, Managers specifically need to be extra conscious about what's happening in their personal lives and the stress. Sure. Um, you know, my best analogy to this is um, some of the greatest coaches, um, the greatest performers on a, on, a, on, a, on a single day, single month, single year. And how do you, how do you re- keep having that, that drive? And yeah. so it's not – um what you think it is and there's managers on some level i think are 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 coaches right sure um where they got to look past the kind of tangible things and what's what's in it what's that person what makes them tick to the point of like can i make them better yeah how much how much support is needed but at the same time letting that individual thrive in a way that they feel that they're in control and i think the insight and the awareness that managers can have is is or to to gain that is is more about empathy uh compassion hyper empathy right? yeah uh emotional intelligence um to like to really get a sense a 360 uh, view of who who is it or who is the the people that I'm surrounded by yeah. and there's and I feel like that because at, at the end of the day everyone's job is hard um, that's right we all we yeah. all tell people our job is hard yeah and and so given that you know I go back to like well who do you want to be in the trenches with yeah you know and if yeah. you if you have a leader that's like you know what I'm grinding with you. That's right. Like I'm going to, we're going to make, we're going to get through this we're gonna together. We're going to do it together. Right? That's right. And when you feel that as much discomfort that you feel in your day-to-day job, you know that someone else is looking out for you. Yeah. Right. They have your best interests at heart. And then if, if nothing else, you'll want to kind of exceed those expectations because at the end of the day, it's not just about the quota part. It's like, you know what, as a person, I respect this individual. If if not, I also want to become like this person. Yeah. I want to be this leader, right? And I look back to my early experiences or the, you know, the sports teams or the people that I idolize. I was like, who is in their corner? Who made them who they are? That's right. You know, and, um, and in that environment, I think uh, managers, directors, senior management, like there's sort of like, you know, there's a million books out there, right? Like there's um, people have achieved so many levels of greatness, but what's the one thing that sets this group apart from another group apart? Mm. And so, um, you know, there's uh, there's the old idea. I'm like, you could have soldiers or you could have warriors, you know, and there's a difference, you know, and there's like that that fundamental feeling of like, what would, if if you can translate or transform somebody, Right. And not just taking orders, but outside of even the work environment where they're a warrior for their family, their friends, in a way that they can take on all this in a way that says, you know what, this person has gone through stuff, but they're still pushing through. Yeah. And that to me kind of 
you know, embodies like what a great manager would be. That's great. That's good stuff. I like the the hyper empathy and I love the self-awareness you point out there. I can't thank you enough for coming on the show, sharing an incredible story of just overcoming this obstacles left and right sure. and coming out smelling like a rose on the other side. <laughs> Trying to. <laughs> yeah. Hey, no worries, man. Listen, I, I feel like folks like you need to be sharing their stories because you are not alone out there. And that's what I tell everybody that's going through it. Yep. Um, so how do people get in touch with you if they want to talk more about your story and what they're going through? Sure. What's the best method for people to reach you? Well, um, that's one of the reasons why I joined uh, Uncrushed. Yeah. You know, I heard uh, Tim Clark's story and I, um, you know, heard John Burroughs. Uh, you know, when I was an account development representative, it's funny how life kind of puts people that's right. uh, in situations. And um, from that process, I wanted to be part of Uncrushed and the movement that we're trying to do, uh, meeting like yourselves, you know. Um, you know, people can find me on Twitter. Uh, my Twitter handle is supernova7 with the number seven. Um, I'm also on LinkedIn. Um, and yeah, I mean, I think on a, on a lot of levels, uh, you know, collectively as a group, we're, we're sharing our stories in the sense that um, I know what it feels like. You know, I know it's super lonely, can be very isolating, but... Um, you know, even just doing this interview, uh, I was like, what am I thinking <laughs> um, in the process? So oh, um, I wanted it's to helpful. thank you. Yeah. Uh, I want to also thank Uncrushed, the team of Uncrushed. Um, you know, we're all scattered all around the United States, but it's moments like these where it's like, you know what? I'm, I'm glad I reached out. That's right. You know? And um, yeah, and then realizing that it can get better. Well, thanks for coming on the show again. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much for our listeners for constantly supporting our mission to spread awareness about